Hi all, it's me, Marissa True, your Tez Talks radio host, and today we have a very special episode with a very special guest. We are joined by Matt Medved, the editor-in-chief and co-founder of NFT Now, a Web3 news and content platform that aims to redefine how creators and their communities share in the value they create. So welcome, Matt. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's been a wild ride since we since we met at NFT Paris, and uh, it's been busy in all the best ways. And uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening. I'm excited to be chatting with you today. Yeah, you exactly as you said. You and I met during the absolute whirlwind that was NFT Paris, and it was easily one of the more memorable conversations I had during that week, which I think says something considering just how many conversations <laughs> I had during my time there. Um, and it was mainly because you actually introduced me to this idea of tokenized media in a really structured and real way. And, you know, you've also recently launched the Now Pass. But before we kind of go down that rabbit hole, because it is a deep one, I want to start with the basics. I want to start with your backstory. So the simplest question is, who is Matt Medved? <laughs> well, you know, I always say that, like, the best career paths are nonlinear, and I definitely took that to heart. Um, you know, I have a whole uh, background in uh, NGOs and nonprofits prior to really going into the media space. Um, worked for a conflict resolution NGO called Search for Common Ground in Nigeria. Um, but, you know, like, for me, it was, uh, like, writing has always been kind of, like, central to, to everything I do. And so, you know, I grew up on creative writing. I grew up on um, you know, I was in bands, like writing songs, I was writing poetry, all of that. And uh, journalism is kind of an extension of, um, of my writing. And um, so I journalism undergrad and then got into the NGO nonprofit space, as I mentioned. And um, it was interesting, like, I think about this really formative period, where I um, was actually finishing up my graduate studies. Uh, I actually did a law and a master's at GW related to everything within NGOs and nonprofits, so international law, international uh, human rights. And uh, I was finishing up with back-to-back -back exchange programs. So I was living in Milan for, um, I think it was about four months, and I lived in Berlin for the better part of a year. And it was in Milan where I discovered this thing called Bitcoin on Reddit in like 2013. And um, I remember buying at the exact top of that market um, you know, it, it like crashed like a week or two later. Um, I just held on to it because I thought the tech was cool. I believed in, I thought the white paper was really interesting. Um, and it was, it was kind of like foreshadowing for me. And um, at the next, uh, when I was living in Berlin is when I actually started to have the opportunity to write for Billboard. So I had also been writing a lot about music on the side um, and writing a lot about dance music specifically. I also DJ and I produce music. And um, had the opportunity to start writing for Billboard about dance music and then realized that there was this incredible opportunity. There were so many creators coming together and like there was just this new wave that was like about to hit America. Um, it was hitting America. And like, you know, I couldn't believe that Billboard dance didn't exist yet. So I started that at Billboard. So I joined Billboard in 2015. Um, founded Billboard Dance, built that into pretty much the leader, you know, in terms of dance music media. And what's interesting is the peak year at Billboard Dance um, actually coincided with uh, the next bull run in crypto. So like 2016 to 2018. And that's when I was like, oh, okay, I was onto something, you know, there. And um, a lot of the artists I was friends with, guys like Blau and RAC and like Miha and like um, were, were, were trading crypto. And I thought it was interesting. And I realized that I was the only person at Billboard who owned crypto or understood it at all. So I started, um, I started uh, writing about like the intersection of music and blockchain at Billboard and did a bunch of like, panels with RAC at South by advice for one of Blau's projects. Um, I, uh, you know, spoke at like consensus ethereal, like I was really kind of like focused on like, how can this technology empower musicians or help us break out of like a broken, like business model for musicians. Um, and now when I think back on it, it was all it, it all it's all feels like foreshadowing now. But you know, I wasn't like aware of it at the time. Um, and then uh, after that, I ran Spin Magazine as editor in chief. Um, exited with the sale of Spin, which was always my favorite magazine growing up. So that was like that was a really special opportunity um, in the top of 2020. And I was actually running content at Modern Luxury, the lifestyle publisher, when Blau pulled me down the NFT rabbit hole. 
in 2020. And um, I just remember, you know, he had, he, you know, we were really active on Clubhouse in those days because I was in New York during COVID. You know, I wasn't going anywhere. I was pacing around this apartment like a madman. And, um, <laughs> you know, I was just like on Clubhouse all the time. And, you know, I, I saw, you know, Blau was getting really into the space with Slime Sunday. And I, I remember being like, hey, man, like, I, I know what an NFT is, but what I need to understand is why you're so passionate about them. And we had this two hour phone call that just like all the light bulbs went off in my head. Like everybody remembers that, like that aha moment, you know, the light bulb moment. And that was it for me. And I was like, this is the technology I've believed in for a long time at this point. Finally disrupting fields I'm actually passionate about. Um, art, music, culture. Because at the end of the day, I'm not a finance guy. You know, like that, that never appealed to me. I always thought crypto was really interesting, but I never jumped in and made it my full thing because I've been, always been more focused and more inspired by uplifting creators and creating opportunities for, for creatives. And so like, it was, it was always this like thing I believed in, but was never my main thing. And that changed when I realized what the, this technology was capable of. And the fact, the critical third box that it checked was the fact that it has the potential to empower creators. And that's been a, a mission of mine, something I've been very passionate about from the very beginnings of my career. And so, you know, it was like all the light bulbs went off in my head. I was like, this is it. And I just started like, relent like, like relentless focus on, on the NFT space. Um, did a lot of interviews with creators. Um, I gave like Fuocious like his first interview in like February 2021. Um, I did um, like a lot, of, a lot of stuff with like Thank You X and, and a bunch of, and just like a lot of like that I was covering, starting to cover the OGs in the space and learning a ton about crypto art and like really going down that rabbit hole. And what was interesting was uh, NFT now kind of came together as we were trying to solve a, a problem we were creating or, or not, not that we were creating, that we were experiencing. And mm -hmm. that problem was um, a lack of credible resources in the space. And so like, as I was like, I mean, I was like, I can't believe this is happening. This is a creative revolution. Like this is, this is insane. Like how are people sleeping on this? And when I wanted to like inform people about it, I just found like there weren't that many great resources to send them to. Like there were a lot of platforms with like megaphones and like company blogs promoting their own, like their own drops and things like that. And then there were like, you know, the talking head influencers who were just like shilling their own bags. And I was like, where's like incredible <laughs> coverage? Like, where's like, where's the billboard of the NFT space? Where's the complex of the NFT space? And right. where's, where's the, but and what's the future of media in with with this technology? And so that's where NFT now was really born. Um, and we've been, you know, so we founded, uh, started the NFT now accounts in January, 2021. Um, myself and my two co-founders, Alejandro Navia and Sam Heisel, we made the, uh, the full-time jump in June of 2021. And it's been a wild ride since, like building the future of tokenized media. Our mission is to empower the creators of culture and to bring this technology from niche to mainstream, because we really do believe that this technology has the potential to really fundamentally redefine how creators and their communities can create and share value together across every category. I mean, firstly, thank you so much for the extensive history. I think, I think I'm fully in alignment with you on the benefits of having a nonlinear career. I've had the same where I started out actually coincidentally as a journalist as well. And I think journalism offers you insight and it lets you sort of hover above a lot of what's happening in the space and it allows you to connect the dots often before other people can register them just because you have the privilege of being the first to be given the raw data. And... I think what's interesting is that what you said from your time in Europe and when you were first introdu introduced to Bitcoin and you made your first investment into crypto, and then you sort of understood that there were some parallels or some correlations between the behaviors of you know the popularity of the music market and this technology. But then what I want to ask is, obviously at that stage, this was pre- I guess, NFT awakening, or even before you really saw NFTs or the purpose behind NFTs, because as you mentioned, that was a little later on when you were speaking with Blau. What was it about the blockchain technology itself that you found so compelling? Because I think a lot of the discourse now is that NFTs are the catch-all solution for everything. But you were saying that you saw solutions before that was actually a factor. So what was it about the core blockchain technology that fascinated you? That's a really great question. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that that really like stuck out to me is that you know, like I graduated uh, undergraduate in two thousand eight. So my my generation, like my my class, we generate we we graduated straight into the financial crisis. You know, like um, and so like the 
I, I was actually like really fortunate because I had set up a job uh, teaching English in South Korea, like right after I, I had, so I, that was all set up before the, cra the crash. Um, so I was like off to Korea to like on this adventure. Um, but for many of my friends, they really struggled to find meaningful work. And these were really talented people and it was through no fault of their own. It was the fault of the centralized banking system. And so when I read the Bitcoin white paper, it really spoke to me in a way about the importance of decentralization uh, and, and those ideas and precepts, which is like, it was really like, it, it introduced me to that because prior to reading the Bitcoin white paper, I didn't necessarily know that like something, like there was a, that, that an alternative like that was possible or viable, you know? And so that really opened my eyes there. And I remember just like, I was sending it to everyone being like, yo, like, and it's, it's funny, like I have all the receipts on my email of all my friends. I sent the Bitcoin <laughs> white paper in 2013 and they didn't listen to me. And like sometimes I like to remind them like every now and then, you know, just to like twist, twist, twist the knife a little bit. Um, but no, but like I was just like, yo, like read about the future of finance. Like this is going to change. This is going to change a lot of things. And, and um, again, like I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was really interesting. Um, but ultimately, like. Like I said, I'm not a finance guy. So it wasn't like I was like, I'm going to devote my life to Bitcoin or I'm going to devote my life to like to centralized currencies or anything like that. I just thought this is cool. Like I'm going to get behind it and I, I'm going to get involved. And um, and then after it crashed, I was like, OK, I, I'm going to hold on to it because like I still think there's something there. And one thing that we have to remember, too, is like, like, you know, I, I, I can't say that I had like like the conviction I have in the space now. Like, I can't say I had that in 2013. Like, I didn't know, like, whether this was going to come back. I didn't know if this was just some random, like, crazy internet, like, thing that had just happened on Reddit and uh, was, like, a flash in the pan. And what's interesting is I think what we have to forget, what we often forget is, like, a lot of people who just went through the first, like, NFT boom, like, you know, real mainstream boom, are probably in that same mindset. You know, if they, if they, if they were new to the space, if that was their first crypto cycle, like, you know, they they're probably in the same place. They're like, uh, that was cool, I guess, but I don't know if this is the future, if this is coming back. And so I always try to empathize with that. Um, but you know, like for me, it was really the, the the power of decentralization. And it was only, and I'll be I'll be real, like I didn't, you know, it was really the next bull run with Ethereum where I started to really start to understand the um the 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 um the possibilities of a decentralized ecosystem and decentralized applications and like and and everything there. And that's when, you know, especially um, like a lot of my friends like Jesse Grushak was working on like Ujo and these like projects at Consensus that were like aimed at trying to like make the music industry a better place and and try to fix the or solve the royalty problems and stuff, you know, to get musicians paid. And I was like, well, this is something I can really get behind. Like, this is something I really believe in. And this technology has some really interesting applications in that way. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it's interesting because I think with each step, you know, the technology has started to um, to really disrupt or or show its potential its potential application to fields that I am truly passionate about, like you know the creator economy and all that. And so, like you know, I, I think it was kind of a it was a progressive escalation of my interest. Um, and mm -hmm. and I think that um, you know what's funny is, but when I saw everything with NFTs in 2020, the feeling I felt was like, I have seen this movie before and I know how it ends. And that was magic internet money, but this time it's art and it's music and it's culture and you don't bet against art and music and culture. Right, I think, I think that is precisely as you say, something that a lot of people struggle with as they're entering the space for the first time, especially those that have entered, as, again, as you said, from the moment of the NFT boom. So my big question was, you know, about the strength of your conviction. And as you said, it started off being a bit of a blind punt based on, you know, a little bit of introductory data you were given. And then as there was a little bit of traction, it kind of validated the initial idea, but it didn't really give you the, I guess, the true grit of the entire movement until a little later on. So I think you're in a very interesting position to have essentially watched, I'm going to say, three to four yeah. cycles I'd of this three. technology and yeah. like the evolutions of this technology um but then as as always with these sorts of things there is an element of consistently having to preach the belief especially when people get skittish yeah. so how do platforms like nft now who you know you have positioned to be sort of the the journalistic authority in the nft space in particular how do you position it so that people continually find faith in it, even when the market is turning around and saying, you know what, 
we're all panicking. We're trying to get out real quick. I think it's a really, really great question. And I think it starts, it starts first off with like education and like being even handed in our coverage and being like barrier car coverage. Like we did a lot of coverage on like, you know, the bear markets, like just like, like people who are thriving in a bear market, like the positive stories, but also the realities that of like what was being faced. Um, I think also like one thing I often say is, but I think our events have been like a really critical part of this, of just like bringing the community together and helping people understand like where this is going. So one thing I often say is that like, I'm really lucky and I, Marissa, I'm sure you're, you're really lucky too. Like we get to, we get to talk to like amazing artists and like visionary builders. Like, you know, I get to like almost every day, if not every day, you know? And so I like, I get that energy every day, like whether it's Twitter space, whether it's in person, whether it's, you know, podcast, whatever it is. And so like, it's really hard to be negative and to really be down on the space when you're constantly getting amazing energy from the builders and the people who are showing up during the bear and all of that. But remember that not everybody gets that. A lot of people only know what they see or what they hear, what they feel from the Twitter echo chamber, right? And so especially like last year, that got pretty dark. And, um, and you know, I, I think that was one of the reasons why we did the Gateway, which was our five-day Web3 Arts and Culture Festival during Miami Basel. We took over uh, two city blocks, 12 buildings in downtown Miami and brought the, brought like the web three community together. We'd have amazing, amazing partners across the board. And, um, and we did it free to the registered public. We opened it for free to the registered public because to me, it was about it. I want people to go to the gateway and leave feeling as inspired about the space as we do. Um, I wanted them to go be able to listen to like amazing, um, speakers in the space. Um, you know, we had everyone from like Gary V to Betty from Dead Fellas to uh, the Verse Verse uh, crew with like Sasha Styles and Anna Maria Caballero and you know Keith Grossman and just like the like across the board, just amazing, amazing um, uh, builders and, and like speakers and artists. And it was you know it was free if you showed up. And um, and I wanted I wanted them to hear from them first firsthand and to like be able to see the art in, displayed in in a way that it should be. You know, we had massive like floor to ceiling projection screens, etc. Like you know experiencing this IRL hits different, right? And mm -hmm. it's really, I think it was really hard for anyone who attended the gateway to like leave being like, yeah, there's nothing to the space. It's over, you know, like, and, and I think that that like, like seeing is believing. Right. And, um, and, and I think that like bringing people together like that, we didn't want anyone to feel priced out. We knew it was a bear market and people were hurting. And like, you know, I, I think that that's part of it. And it's like, we continue to showcase like, you know, rising artists and, and great stories in the space. Um, because we do have that conviction, like, you know, like digital ownership mm -hmm. isn't going anywhere where we are the last generations to grow up without digital ownership from day one. And so, like, I, I know that future generations are going to grow up owning things both digitally and physically. They're going to accept them for like their own unique strengths and appeals. They're not going to get into these like, I got these, these like silly hangups that, that, that like our generations do. Like, they're not going to be like, right click save or how do I hang it on my wall? Like Gen Z already gets this, <laughs> right? Like with Fortnite and Roblox and like, and, and all that, like whether it's tokenized or not, like they get this idea of like digital ownership. And so like it, the future is really clear for us. So it's mm -hmm. all about just helping people see that. And also meeting people, where, meeting where the market is, because like I'm also, you know, uh, you know, part of our mission, the lab, you know, is, is about bringing this technology from niche to mainstream. So like we're not content to just like preach to the, the, the crypto native choir. Right. We want to bring in the masses. We always want to convert the masses. And like we're under no illusions as to the challenges there. Like mm -hmm. I did the crypto learning curve in 2013 with Bitcoin when like you couldn't trust anything. And like, you know, it was like that, that healthy paranoia of like not your keys, not your coin. Um, but. And I still had to go through the NFT learning curve in 2020. And there are a lot of people who are doing both at once. And those are, that's really daunting. We're not there yet from a UI UX, uh, you know, place. That's where I think a lot of people get caught up is the fact that the learning curve seems to continually be getting steeper. And I think yeah. a lot of people feel like if they couldn't get in at the first floor, then they've missed the lift altogether. And I, so, you know, I think it's amazing to have hosted an event of that scale and of that magnitude that's free and open to the public. But the question I wanna ask is, you know, did you see a clear difference in the kinds of people who were being attracted to these events? Because naturally, I think when you've bought into this space, it's easy to be a bit more skittish around a bear market. And then you will check out this, check out cultural events like this and it may restore an element of your faith or kind of revive your interest in the space because of the amount of culture that's being injected into it and embedded throughout it. But then do you find that the, the actual 
I guess, convincing of the mainstream public and attracting them into the space is still a challenge? Is that something that we're still only incrementally getting better at? Or do you see this interest basically growing exponentially? Because I would say from some of my experience at some of the larger crypto events, it's always very familiar faces. And whether people have been burned by the bear market or they're you know, generally still a little bit cautious, they come in with a common mindset or a common approach to the space, but it doesn't necessarily lend itself to the beginner friendly dialogues that we need to attract the absolute beginners into the space yet. It's a really good question. And it's something we've really seen, like we've seen it really depend, like especially, um, you know, prior to the bear, you know, we were doing a lot of like NFT now presents like local programming in like New York and, and other cities, um, just like panels and like happy hours and bring people together and education. Um, and like we were seeing the whole spectrum, like a lot of like people who were like, I've never bought an NFT before, but like I follow you guys on Instagram and I think this is really interesting. I just want to learn more to like, you know, the like the savvy, like, like, you know, deep down the rabbit hole purists in the space. Right. And so that's actually one thing that's really interesting is that that's how we actually view um, we view like the, like our, our, co like a community base, um, mm -hmm. is in like two buckets. And I want to give uh, credit to where it's due because we got this framework from, uh, the late and great Virgil Abloh, um, who we actually were really fortunate enough to have a call with like an exploratory call with, um, prior to his passing in the very early days of NFT now, before we'd made the full-time jump, because my co-founder, Sam had actually, his agency had worked with Virgil before. So they had a relationship and Virgil was super curious about NFTs and like, uh, web three, it wasn't called web three back then, but you know, and like it was, uh, and he, as we now know, he was working on a DAO, uh, but he didn't mention that in the call. He did a lot. He, he was just asking questions and we were listening and we were answering. But one of the things he told us, which really stuck with us and really informed our entire approach, was that he saw in, in we, when he was looking at the luxury space, we look at the streetwear space, et cetera. He saw it broken into the purists and the tourists in the space. And mm -hmm. we thought about how does that apply to Web3. And it's like, we well, have the, obviously the purists are like the DGENs, the one people on like Twitter spaces until ungodly hours. Like I am very guilty of being one of the purists in the space, like, <laughs> like, not sleeping, like all over, like deep, deep on FX hash, you know, going wild, going nuts in that discord, you know. But then you have the, the, the tourists who are a really important segment for mainstream adoption. And for them, it's like, maybe they follow NFT now on Instagram, but you know, they're right. not really active on Twitter. Maybe they uh, bought, uh, maybe they never owned an NFT, but they think it's interesting. Maybe they saw their favorite artist post a board ape and was like, what's this? You know, maybe their favorite artist did an NFT and they own one that they bought, you know, like, and so, but they're not like deep in it. And what's interesting is like, how do you bring people along that journey of discovery? How do you go for, like, down that funnel? from like the purists to the tourists. And I've seen it, or excuse me, from the tourists to the purists. And I've seen mm -hmm. it firsthand with our community. Like we've always said with NFT now, we're like the main, we're the onboard ramp to the mainstream market. And I think that, you know, has the mainstream market cooled on this space a bit since the bear? Of course. Yeah. But there mm -hmm. are still people discovering. There are still people going down that rabbit hole. There's I'm see I see it every day, especially with our community now that we launched the Now Pass. You know, I always I think when I think about like that journey of discovery, maybe the journey of, of discovery with NFT now starts on our Instagram page or our TikTok and uh, and you see a video that's interesting, you start following us. And then eventually you start to like want to learn more. You're you you get in touch with the community. You go to one of our events. You you know you hop on. You start listening to our podcast. You hop on a Twitter space. And next thing you know, you're in our Discord. And like wow, this seems like a cool group of people. And uh, mm -hmm. I, you know I'm I, I'm interested in succeeding in Web three. And then that leads you to eventually like joining the community by buying a now pass. And like I've seen that journey like happen, and it's really yeah. really special. Um, and so I, I think that like when we think about the events, I think events are a really good opportunity to bring those segments together and are kind of like break down some of the barriers between them because like there were obviously we saw all the like the biggest artists and collectors and such like rolled through the gateway, you know, the builders, the project founders. We also had a lot of people who were just really curious about Web3. And, um, you know, and that was really heartening to see because, um, you know, I, I think that I think that, you know, that's that's we, we're going to have to reach across the, you know, in order to cross the chasm, like we need we need people who aren't in the purest camp um, to really start to care and even more critically understand the possibility and the potential of the space. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've said it a million times before, like no one ever forgets minting their first NFT, but there are stages before that. And I think the other issue is that the transition from, you know, 
uh, tourist to native is almost binary. There's no real sort of in between where you can straddle both conversations. You're either all in or you're not in at all. And so, as you said, education is is so fundamental to that. It's so fundamental to any kind of adoption of the blockchain, whether it's cryptocurrency or NFTs. And, you know, despite how how it's, you know mainstream NFTs have become in our everyday vernacular, a few people actually fundamentally understand neither the purpose nor the potential. And then so, you know, then you've got a media platform like NFT Now who's guiding that conversation and you've positioned yourself very successfully as like a key media authority when it comes to not only the news surrounding that space, but that education piece. But given, you know, there, there's so much noise here. Yeah. There's so many conflicting narratives. You know, you can read about a, a PFP project that sounds like the most promising holy grail of PFP projects. PFP projects available within the space and then you'll go on Twitter and people will be ripping it apart and then completely destroying any sense of conviction you had that maybe this was something you wanted to invest in so obviously there's the importance of education but it also demonstrates there's the critical importance of trust so yeah. how do you actually build yeah. trust within your community how do you how do you ensure that when people come to you for information they truly believe what you have to say or how do you put yourself in a position where you also are fully confident about the information that you're sharing? Really great question. Really great question. And, you know, um, we, we've been we've been building the space for two years, building that trust and credibility. And like part of it was about saying no a lot. We said a no to a lot. We said to no, no to so many things during the especially during the bull market. We said no a lot more than we said yes. And I can tell you that all of those low effort cookie cutter PFP projects, all of those, you know, cash grab projects and the like, they they came to us and tried to throw money at us for promotion and all that. And we said no to all of them. We left high seven figures on the table in revenue, which is not easy to do as a as a media startup, you know, and, and that is in our first year. But we recognized that our credibility was worth a lot more than that. And we also recognized mm -hmm. that we needed that like that we had a responsibility to our community to to ensure that that the that we, what we were putting in front of them um, was 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 accurate, authentic, credible, that they were being set up for success, that they were getting best practices, you know, things like wallet security, things that they needed to know to be able to navigate the space, how to spot scams, how the, all those we wanted to arm them with information. Um, and so what was really interesting was we said actually no to all partnered content for a very long time. And then we finally said yes. Uh, and the first people we said yes to were actually Coinbase and United Masters. And that's like the bar we set. And we were like, we are setting a very high standard um, with, with like partnered content. And, like, and we always make sure that it's very obviously stated. Um, you know, everything's hashtag partner, et cetera, on social and the like. And, you know, it's, it says sponsored on there. We make it very clear because we don't want anyone to, to, you know, that there would be any gray areas. And the other thing too, is like, we only do it when it really makes sense. And like, for example, the piece that we did was um, on like the top music NFT mo like moments of 2021. Um, it was an amazing piece uh, that we would have written probably anyway. And, you know, it, and it just was, you know, presented by Coinbase United Masters. Um, so it, it really mm -hmm. like, it, 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 it checked our boxes in terms of like our editorial integrity and everything there. So I think it's really been about holding mm -hmm. high standards, sticking to them, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's all about the, like the long-term vision for us. Like we have a, we have a saying at NFT now, like we play long-term games with long-term people. We don't like, you can't buy a social post on NFT now. You can't like buy just like an article, like anything we do from a partnership perspective is about like transformational versus transactional. And it's about like, how do we like, it needs to be a, a long-term engagement, you know, and there's no, like, no one-offs and the like. And so um, I think, like, setting that standard was really, was really key. I think another thing in terms of, like, our credibility has been, um, you know, the fact that we're trying to do things differently than, than other media companies. Um, we'll talk more about this as we get into NowPass, but, like, we do believe that Web2 Media, the, that media model is broken. Um, we think programmatic advertisements have created a perverse incentive um, for, for media companies to build audience scale over audience depth. And so like we, from, from day one, we have never had programmatic ads on our, on our website. We also believe in privacy as a, as a fundamental human right. We don't use pixels. We don't use uh, cookies. We don't track our users. Um, we believe there's a better way. 
and it can sense important mm -hmm. to us. And so, you know, I think like also just like being like holding true to our principles. Like the other thing too, is that like, you know, I think like in terms of reporting, we're very objective and, and even handed as you need to be. But at the same time, we take stances. Like we staked out, we took out our, our mission is to empower the creators of culture. So, you know, when the creator royalty debate was going on, we sided with the artists and we still do. You know, and, and we, mm -hmm. we really made, put that out there like we believe in creator royalties. We believe that that's what differentiates the space and its potential from, you know, the the Web 2 bullshit, you know, and we were like, this is this is what like, you know, like we we're we're not going to mince words about this. And, you know, I think that a lot of creators in the, in the space appreciated the fact that, that we did that. And so the other thing, too, is uh, I love that when you said that, uh, like when you said there's so much noise because we have a we have another saying at NFT now, like and it, like internally, we're like we like try to be the signal in the noise. Like that's what it's all about mm -hmm. for us. Be the signal in the mm -hmm. noise. Um, and uh, I and actually the artwork for the now pass is inspired by that concept. And uh, like our, our CTO and creative director, Aaron, who, who designed it, actually channeled that saying and like this whole signal in the noise. And there's a really cool dynamic where we can actually send messages directly to holders in the metadata uh, when they go to now pass that XYZ with, on the gallery side. And there's a whole dynamic where you actually like, you find the signal in the noise by like dragging it around. You'll hear like the symbol, <laughs> you'll just say like, wow, wow, wow. and then if you, if you hold it in the right, in the right place, it'll actually unlock the message, which is also really cool. So it's a way for us to communicate with our community directly without having to deal with centralized platform algorithms and the like. And so this is some really cool things, but um, we like, that's our, that's our mission. That's our mantra, like be the signal in the noise, be the credible source. Um, you know, a lot of the other media companies or platforms or like, so, you know, like that, that were existed during the bull run, like a lot of them are gone. Like people that we would have considered mm -hmm. our competitors, you know, like back in the day, like they're, they're gone because they prioritize short-term revenue over credibility, authenticity, and like a real mission that they could hang their hat on. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's a challenge that faces a lot of businesses that are starting out in this space. And I like what you said earlier. I think it was transformational over transactional, yeah. which is which is, I think, a simple it's almost overly simplistic, but a very important principle, because I think when you are a business in this space, you do face a very confronting challenge, which is the principle over the growth potential. And it is very difficult to sacrifice very promising revenue that's going to give you longevity and runway for the sake of a non-tangible principle that you know you just tend to stand by. And I like, and I wanted to drill down into this and to sort of pivot our conversation slightly about the responsibility you attach to the trust that you've cultivated with your audience. Because mm -hmm. I think this is where I want to bring in this notion of mental health within the Web3 yeah. space. And, you know, it's, I know it's a space that you're very passionate about. I've listened to a couple of your interviews where you've spoken about it. But just for our audiences, what is the mental health crisis that you feel the NFT and crypto world is facing and almost perpetuating. Yeah, look, I, I've been saying it that I, I feel the NFT space is headed for a mental health crisis. Actually, we're probably already in one. Um, but you know, I, I think that it's just the the, the nature of the beast. Um, if you think about it, it's like twenty four seven markets that don't respect weekends, that don't respect holidays. Like things are happening at all hours. Um, it does not turn off. It does not stop. Um, and the space moves so quickly. Like I always say in Web3, weeks are months and months are years. And so it's really hard just to stay on top of all the time. And so like, we have to remember that like, there's there's always a dark side, like there's the downside to the roller coaster ride. It's like, you know, the bull market was all froth and like number go up and excitement and sales and things like that. But now you're having the, the flip side of it. And um, there are a lot of people who um, aren't built for that. In fact, I don't actually don't think that like, anyone is built for that all the time like the fomo the regret the like the sleepless nights like the substance abuse that, that could come with it like you know the um like it it's 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 like a recipe for disaster it's like a pressure cooker actually that i think actually also can exacerbate and amplify pre like conditions that people deal with on a day-to-day -day anyway like anxiety like depression um you know like insomnia things like that and and so i think that um, this, this space can really bring it out of us because you have, like, if you think about it, it's like life-changing wealth, like being won and lost overnight. Um, you know, a, a constantly like the, like Twitter's chatter box that's constantly going where it's really easy to compare yourself to others. Um, and like these, uh, you know, these, these market cycles that a lot of people haven't experienced before. Like, that's another thing too, is that, 
you know, uh, one thing I, I recognize is, um, you know, this was, as you said, my third crypto cycle. So I know what it feels like to have that gut wrenching feeling mm -hmm. when like, you know, everything's crashing around you and like, you know, you're holding on to something or you're in a position that you didn't expect to be in or, you know, you're scared or you don't know what, what's ahead. And for me, it's like I have that conviction. I have that experience to fall back on. But for a lot of people, especially people in the creative space, um, they came into this space through NFTs. And that was mm -hmm. the, what they've experienced is the first their first crypto bear market. And mm -hmm. it, it's not easy. Like it's not even easy, even if you're a seasoned vet, but your first one, like, you know, you go, you, you go from like, you know, sales and, and like, you know, this new creative economy and all time highs and like all that to the other side of the, of, of the coin. And um, it can be a really dark, depressing and alienating space, especially for creators and creatives who tend to be more sensitive to these things anyway, than like people who come from the financial sector or, you know, traders and the like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, there was a lot of like toxic positivity during the during the bull run that a lot of people are, are realizing, you know, just how toxic and, and kind of divorced from reality that was. Um, and no one really gives you a guide to this I mean, we were trying to with NFT now, but like, a lot of artists who got into the space, they didn't know like best practices for like, you know, setting aside money for taxes with big sales or things like that. Or like a lot of people got overexposed in like in ether and, you know, digital assets that uh, that are now worth a lot less than they anticipated or when uh, or when they received them. And some people are in really tricky like situations because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like the learning curve is steep and the markets are really unforgiving. And that all has a real mental health toll. The other thing I want to mention, too, is that project founders are, are in like a pressure cooker as well, especially especially when you think about um, the constant demands of like a holder community, you know, like that's, that's a very real thing. And I've watched this, like a lot of artists built. Uh, it's one thing to be like a, a like a founder, or like a, you know, like a business person or like an executive or like someone who's like, okay, like the business model is about like serving this community. But I've also seen a lot of artists come into the space, you know, release perhaps like additions or release like a project. And then now all of a sudden now they have a holder based community that's like expecting them to do a lot of things that they like, that's aren't necessarily like like cut out to do and mm -hmm. the negativity that you know the social media like um like trolls and like all of that like that all has a real effect that all has a real effect yeah. and and i and i've understand why a lot of a lot of artists have left the space because of like you know needing to take mental health breaks and the like and the pressures that 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 they that they feel are very real yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these problems are unfortunately systemic to what we can kind of refer to as crypto culture. I mean, yeah. it's like you said, it's the thrill, it's the adrenaline, whether it's coming to like, you know, whether it's rushing to mint, whether it's day trading. And the issue with boundary setting in its healthiest sense is that it comes at the expense of, you know, the potential growth of your personal wealth, which yeah. obviously isn't necessarily going to be appealing to a a variety of different people. And then on top of that, you know, you have, you have this, um, you have this culture of instant gratification, which does add a lot of pressure to the, to the creators and to the founders in the space. And if you just take Twitter as a microcosm of what this culture looks like, the aggression through which you can praise and then tear someone down is so swift and brutal mm -hmm. that it's almost impossible for anyone to armor themselves against that kind of emotional volatility, regardless of the market volatility. So, I mean, it's a somewhat of a personal question and only if you're, you know, you're comfortable yeah. sharing, but is this something you struggled with personally as the creator of such a huge platform like NFT now? And if it was, how did you actually navigate it? Because as you said, again, this is your third cycle of it, but yeah. I'm sure that your experience across each cycle was markedly different from one another because you faced a variety of different experiences and challenges for each one. This is, this is an excellent question. It's one that's actually going to segue really well into uh, into like into something that I think is, is very much of interest for Tez Talks. And so um, what, what's what's interesting is so first cycle was really just dabbling, you know, like bought some Bitcoin, watched it crash, held on to them you know, wasn't too upset about it, but also didn't like double down and buy a ton more. I was just like, oh, okay. Like, I believe in that. I never sold it. I actually still haven't sold that Bitcoin, you know, like, uh, you know, and, and, but I was just like, you know what, it, it was always about supporting the technology and being really, I was just really interested in it. And I was a student at the time, you know, 
it what I what I spent on it was you know not insignificant, but it also didn't put me in like a in a in a tough situation or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. um, the next cycle, 2016 to 18, was interesting because that's when I actually started trying to trade crypto for a bit, and okay. um, and I actually and, and one thing I learned quickly is I am not a trader. I may be a good <laughs> long-term investor. Like I may be able to spot trends early. Like those are all things I think I like, I like collecting with conviction and all that has been served me well in the NFT space. But like as a trader, I was, and I, and I watched the, I watched like the mental health, my mental health deteriorate because I was like spending so much time, like glued to the charts. Uh, I was like feeling like my emotions were like tied to like these like micro movements and the like and then like you know you'd have like you'd think you're on top and then like you're like you know like the, the rug gets pulled out from under you like and you're like oh like you go from thinking i'm i'm really smart to like i'm an idiot to like all of this and like that right and ultimately you know i spent hours like trying to learn technical analysis like pouring over charts like trying to trying to do stuff i had some wins i had some losses i eventually did the math and if i had just kept it all in bitcoin and eth i would have come out ahead slightly like, you know, so all that energy, all that lost sleep, all that like time and attention was like, honestly, kind of a wash and it was wasted for me. And I recognize that. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I recognize that, like, you know, especially when, it, when you're thinking, you know, the best traders don't have any emotions in the game. Right. And that's really hard to like, that's really hard to learn. And I, you know, I just don't think I'm wired that way. So I stopped doing that. And I've been a lot happier since. Now, one thing that's really interesting is we think about this last cycle, like, you know, being you know, running a company like NFT now and having to be on top of everything all the time in the a Web3 space that's moving so quickly and, you know, there's so much happening at once is really challenging and really difficult. Um, and uh, especially compounded with like, you know, being a high growth startup and, and all that and the volatility. Um, so definitely some, some challenges, some amazing opportunities, but also some challenges. And one of the ways that I actually, well, first off, I started meditating daily, which was really, really helpful to help me navigate the space. But another way that I actually found really productive and healthy to decompress was collecting on Tezos. Um, because for me, it, it always came from a place of uh, appreciation, like collecting art on Tezos was like my way of like unwinding at like the end of the day, because everything my it was a totally different mindset from like, trade, like but buying or trading or collecting NFTs on ETH, where like, you know, on Tezos, for me, there's there's no financial calculus whatsoever. Like, I'm not ever thinking about ROI. I'm thinking about how can I support this artist? I'm thinking about this is a really cool, like, I, I think this is really cool. I want to I wanna get it. It's like, it comes from like a place of patronage. It comes from like a place of support. And it comes from a place of like really loving that community. It Like I used to say, like prior, uh, with the exception of the NFT Now Discord, like the only other Discord I've actually enjoyed being in, uh, with the exception of NFT Now, is actually the FX Hass Discord. Because I think it's a really dope community and it's good energy and it's good vibes and people are there for like really cool like the right reasons and so like you know for me um collecting on tezos was like a way for me to like unplug unwind like really like break out of that like that like market driven news cycle driven um you know non-stop like uh, uh climate and then just really start to like discover artists from a place of pure appreciation um and get to support artists from like, and and one, what's cool is what I always say is like, what I love about collecting on Tezos is, um, you know, it, it obviously it's a much for it, largely it's for, for many, it's a, it's a much more affordable entry point. Um, you, you know, that there's, you know, so you're, you know, there, there's amazing art available so cheap relative to, to, you know, Ethereum and the like. And um, there are artists from all over the world uh, creating on the platform. And I think that like there were a lot of artists who were priced out of Ethereum because of the the gas fees and and like the minting fees and the like, especially during the bull run when it was like really out of control. Um, and they're, they're minting on Tezos and actually like buying a piece of art. There, there are a lot of artists from developing countries and there are artists for whom like, you know, if you buy a $15 piece, like that could actually really move the needle for them. That could really change, you know, that could be, that's a really significant. Whereas for me, it's like $15, I'm happy to spend that on a piece of art and hold that forever and like never expect to see that back. That's okay. It's more about supporting the artist. It's, as I said, it's like a place of patronage and to be able to like get the, like to, to, like experience just the goodwill from some of the, the artists that I was supporting and build relationships with them. It was like really special. It felt like, it felt really special. It actually reminded me of like the early days. Uh, I always said like collecting on like Hiccup Nunk, you know, at that, at like, you know, in uh, end of 2021 um, was probably like the closest that I'll ever experience to what it was like to collect on like super rare in the early, early days. Right. Um, because it was like, 
artists just like creating out of a place of like experimentation and and excitement and like not really thinking about like sales or, or this as like a financial instrument um and collectors just like really going from that like that pure place um and um and and so like to me it's, it's really special and uh, that's why I, I, I own, I own, I own many more, uh, by sheer numbers, I own certainly more NFTs on Tezos than any other blockchain. Well, I mean, it's obviously music to our ears, both as, you know, to, as, as a Tez Talks host and also, also to our community that someone as influential as yourself is actively participating in, in collecting art. And I think, I think the thing that really differentiates Tezos is, or at least the art and the creator space on Tezos is that you truly see the demarcation between market value and intrinsic value. And then over the course of time, hopefully they meet in the middle because as you said, a lot of this art is extremely affordable, but it is also highly valuable. And sometimes I think that, you know, the market should more actively recognize that these art pieces are very much undervalued and they should be sold for a lot more. But I think, I think that remains to be seen. I think that's something that we will witness over the course of time. And I like that you've also acknowledged that there's a diversity to this space because, you know, we have the generative art and FX hash. We have the sort of like the original art community that Gris, uh, started with Hicket Nunk, which is obviously now Taya. We have the collector models on object.com where we have a lot more of the collector base and, you know, some of Tezos' own PFP projects. So there's just so much going on. And I love that that offered you a bit of mental respite against, again, the rest of the noise that was happening in the the bigger crypto ecosystem. So yeah, that's and it still excellent. Does. And it still does. You know, like I when I like open up object or like FX hash, it's like, you know, it's totally different. Like it's a totally different mindset for me than like opening up like an open sea or anything like that. Because it's like, A, I love my collection and I'm always trying to like add to it. And like and it's and B, it's just like it's like this, it's like discovery. It's like this journey mm. of discovery. Like I think that's what really like excites me as well is like, you know, like, I love going down rabbit holes. I love like treasure hunts. Like I love just like discovering new artists, like, you know. And so many amazing artists that I've, I've actually like so we've supported on NFT now. I originally discovered through Tezos, you know, and like it's been like really like a really special. It's really been really special to see a lot of artists like kind of blossom. Um, you know, it's funny actually. Like like a lot, some people don't know, I'm actually like one of like the biggest holders of uh, Alpha Centauri Kids like early Tezos work. Um, and it was like, you know, when he was like really experimenting there and, and all that. And like, you know, I, I remember like he actually, he actually made like a one of one for me on Tezos. It's called like for Medved. And that's like, honestly, probably like the NFT that like is closest to my heart. It's like that and the crypto punk, but like the crypto punk is actually in this piece in this one of one from like, and it's from like April, like, I mean, it must've been what April, it was April, 2021. Um, you know, and that was minted on Tezos and, uh, and it's like, okay, like, you know, um, like to see his journey and to see like how far he has come and, you know, we've been a big part of that, but it was originally like Tezos that we like bonded over, you know, before he like really exploded on, on ETH and, and all that. And, um, you know, there's just like a lot of, there are a lot of like cool stories like that. Like I love to see success of artists like, um, like Louis Ponce or, or Ponce, like I, I think, um, you know, who's been very active on Tezos. I, I owned a lot, like a bunch of his like Tezos editions. And then all of a sudden I see he's like, just like tearing it up on ETH and all that. Like you love to see it like Lucrece or like, you know, some of these other artists, like a lot of artists who started on Tezos, like are, are now like really making waves. And I think that's something we're going to continue to see. I, I love like what FX hash represents because it's an opportunity for generative artists to like, like have sovereignty over like, over how they do their own work. Like what, what Manifold has done for artists, I think on the Ethereum side, in terms of like allowing artists to release how they want, when they want, you know, and, and really giving them the tools they need to succeed. I feel like FX hash has really done that for generative artists on the Tezo side. And that's, that's exciting and cool to see. Um, and, um, you know, I, I love FX hash. I love, love that. Just love, love that, that whole vibe. Love that whole team. It was great. You were there when I met, uh, Sifford and Ozzy for the first time. So. Yeah, I remembered when I made that introduction. I think it was probably one of the cutest things I've ever seen happen <laughs> in, in you know, my time during blockchain, which is to see 
you know, two guys who are super fans of NFT now meeting two guys who are super fans of FX hash. And it was just, it was all love. It was actually, it was so endearing to watch. So I was very happy to have been a part of that. Um, but to bring this all back to the, you know, the mental health equation, I think, I think what's amazing about platforms like this that are being built and kind of reinstating and re-empowering the creator that's at the root of it all it means that tools are being developed to help buffer against some of the systemic issues that we're looking at in the space. Like it's allowing us the opportunity to make sure that we don't replicate problems that have existed for us in the past. So it leaves us with the fundamental question of, you know, is this sort of crypto culture moment just a phase that's going to fade once blockchain technology becomes a little bit more embedded in our everyday lives? Or is this something that we're actually going to have to consciously you know, seek to deconstruct because this hype cycle or the excitement and the thrill of entering this space at this point in time is very much the thing that's helping it grow at the rate that it has. So it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a dilemma in terms of do we do we sacrifice that pace for making sure that our structure like the structural or the foundational components are secure enough that everyone's feel everyone feels safe to participate in it it's a really good question i mean look like i always say like don't bet against medium native culture you know what i mean like i feel as though like the the projects that are launching on the space like like out of this place are going to be the ones that have like the most you know, like are going to continue to like really move the needle and um, and and really kind of be the like the, the, the ones that that continue to be ascendant. It's like when you think about um, like the invention of any new technology form, it's like when um, like when uh, we went from photo photography to like moving images. Right. Like it's not like just the best photographers became the best film directors. Right. Like it's not like the best. You know, it, it's like there's there's always like a new breed a new crop of like creators who are like medium native um who kind of like like rise to that um same thing if you go back a gap back on like it's not like the best painters became the best photographers right and so like i think that um you know when you think about like this technology and this new medium um i think what we're seeing are like a lot of these like medium native creators who are like really rising to the forefront and i think that they're going to be driving the culture for a long time um that doesn't that doesn't mean that like you know uh you know brands and and ip and and the like that that have great communities already existing in web 2 aren't going to come in and succeed here um but success is not uh is not guaranteed you know what i mean we've seen that a lot with a lot of people who have like you know just because you have a big following a big audience in web 2 doesn't mean that you're going to succeed in web 3 and i think that that comes down to like the difference between audience and community which actually is at the core of like everything we're doing with uh with the now pass and like the future of tokenized media like you know at the end of the day like audience is aware that you exist like they may follow you on a social platform they may like your your post hey they might they may even actually go to your events or buy your product but ultimately it's still a one way street of exchange um the, and ultimately the 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 web 2 model was about you know for creators or content creators or, or media companies even like they were create you're, you're creating content in this like likes and comments economy as in it to monetize like to build to build audience as a means to an end to like monetize indirectly as like a middleman for brands right and um and that's that's the that's the programmatic advertising model for for media companies that's the like influencer model with brand partnerships for you know like individual creators and like the creator economy um, and again, not, I'm not knocking anyone there. Like the technology wasn't, didn't exist, like, you know, but now what we've seen are so many of those amazing creators come into web three, uh, and all of a sudden you can actually build community rather than audience community. The difference there is community wants to see you win. And actually what community wants is they want to win together because your success is their success because in web three, they often have a literal stake in what you're doing. Um, you know, and that's really powerful because it unlocks a different level of connection. It un it, it's, the, it's the difference between being a fan and a shareholder, right? Difference between being like a supporter and an ambassador. And that's a really powerful force. And so in Web3, you know, you have these community-driven projects or community-driven um, artists or creators that um, can actually, what you can do is you can create value 
for that community. You can build community directly rather than like, rather than being indirect, you can directly monetize by, by sharing in the value that you're creating for your community. And, um, and that's what we're looking to do. So I think like when we think about people coming into the space and whether like the crypto native is going to maintain, like it's, it's like, it's relevance. I think like people who are innovating and, mid, and, and, and uh, in a medium native way are, are always going to be leading this charge. Right. And uh, that's what we're trying to do with the media space with, uh, with, uh, in terms of uh, building the future of tokenized media, the now network, which the now pass is is your is your key, is your access pass to, and um, and really pioneering this community centric media model. So I, I think that touches on a lot of points that I want to cover as we go into the the Web three media and tokenized media aspect of this conversation, which is there is a very resistant relationship to the ways in which we engage with online media today, whether it's a social media platform or a news site, because as you said, we are a data point, you know, we are tracked by cookies. There's a lot of programmatic advertising that we're at the mercy of, and you can't help but feel like there's this uneven hand where to be able to consume critical information that's going to inform your daily life, you have to pay a tax that you weren't necessarily willing to pay in the first place as it relates to your, you know, something as simple but as valuable as your personal data. So when you enter into this Web3 version of media and tokenized media, can you can you just help us like crystallize and define what that actually is? Like yeah. what is it about tokenized media that protects the consumer and gives them more value in a way that Web2 Media hasn't. Yeah. Well, let's first talk about like why Web2 Media is broken, right? To understand like what the why this why this is a, a why this is innovation that that is positive. We have to understand kind of where where, where we're coming from. And so, you mm. know, I think what's important to understand is like you know, as like the, with the rise of social media, it led to like this explosion of traffic to uh, media publication sites. All of a sudden, like you know, especially with Facebook and Google, um, you know media companies were getting more eyeballs than ever before. They were getting more attention than ever before. Um, and it actually became addicted to that audience, to that, or to that, to that traffic. And so um, media platforms started actually tailoring their content and their coverage to maximize that. Uh, and that, that's why we found ourselves in what I like to call it this like clickbait race to the bottom. Because algorithms uh, reward sensationalist headlines, um, the quality of coverage has, like, I think, really declined and also become a lot more homogenous. We saw this during the bull run with NFTs and Web3, like some of those headlines that just like displayed a fundamental misunderstanding of how blockchain technology works, you know, especially around like, you know, the perceived environmental impacts and the like. And like there was just a lot of people who were looking to create outrage because outrage equates to clicks, right? They weren't, mm -hmm. it was like, that was a higher priority than informing their communities or informing their audience. Um, and so like polls even show like public trust in media has reached an all time low. Um, and, you know, I, I think that part of that too is like this like race to be first and like, you know, because first gets, gets everything with the algorithms. Um, that's, there's been a lot of like inaccurate reporting that has to be walked back and things like that. And so like generally just like media publications, like, you know, and this is not a good thing. This is a really bad thing. Media is, has an incredibly important role to play. And so like public trust eroding is how we get into this like world of like fake news and like, and these like ideological echo chambers, which are not healthy. Um, another thing that's critical is like, I think it understands that with programmatic ads, as um, as as that media model, as that broken business model became the norm, um, it reduced us, like you said, to one data point, to traffic, like eyeballs to be monetized and discarded. No distinction made between the quality and the quantity of an audience. Like, and so, mm -hmm. um, and there was a whole industry built around this with ad tech, and like people started figuring out, like, okay, cool, like I can track if I can track you on the internet. I can actually serve you better, quote unquote, better ads, you know, which are going to like be, you know, just continue to ramp up the amount of eyeballs, the things that are more interesting for you. And like, you know, it's just like that, that like cash cow that they saw it as. And that's how these violations of privacy came to be, where, you know, people started being tracked without like explicit consent and, you know, these pixels and the cookies and all of that. And, you know, for us, we're like, we know that there's a better way. Right. Mm -hmm. Like one thing we like to say at, at NFT now is like we believe that media companies shouldn't serve you advertisements. They should serve you opportunities. And that's where I think you think about the power of like a tokenized community. Um, 
look, like I, I think that it's clear to me that this is the next phase. This is the next. This is the next frontier. Um, storytelling, like technology, has always pushed storytelling forward, right? Like ever since the Gutenberg printing press, uh, you know, and then the invention of the internet, like brought everything digital, and then the um, like you know the advent of mobile. All of a sudden, like media companies had to optimize for mobile. Like now tokenized media is that next phase. And what's actually really incredible is that not only will tokenization and, and the creation of these tokenized communities um, change how stories are told and, and, and consumed, but it can actually also redefine relationships that have been kind of like cemented for a really long time. And that's where I think everything I talked about, the difference between audience and community comes in, where you think about these web two media publications, like, most people are loyal to the headline, not to the brand, right? Like, mm -hmm. you don't really have a, like, there's no, no one has, like, most people don't really have an incentive to, like, share one newspaper versus the other, right? Or to, like, consume one newspaper's content versus the other. Obviously, like, you know, there are, there are some outliers, like, New York Times have a, has a very successful subscription model, but they're the New York Times, right? And so, like, you know, but, like, when you get beyond some of these, like, really, like, like top players, you're, like, Where's where's the like the incentive for anyone to like really feel any loyalty there, especially at a time when most media companies are covering the same things in the same way and becoming a lot more homogenous because of consolidation in the industry and also that this whole clickbait race to the bottom I mentioned, um, and it's like you know at the end of the day it's a one way street. You go to most of these web two media publications, you go to their Twitter feeds, you go to their social feeds, and it's literally just like how many links can I put in front of you so that you click. There's no conversation. There's no like dialogue. There's no like exchange of information. And what's what's actually like un like unfortunate about this and kind of sad is like, you know, this what I, what I is that like media is supposed to be like the the town the town square, right? It's supposed to be the marketplace of ideas. It's supposed to be the place where like people have a voice and can come together and like you can share different perspectives and things like that. And like I feel like it we we've, we've really moved away from that in this Web two model. And so what we're doing is trying to like really think, think about like, all right, what is a token, what does like a tokenized media ecosystem look like and a, and a community centric media model look like? And I think it comes down to like really super serving your core community. It's about finding those people who, um, who are really all about what you're doing and cr actually creating incentives for them to take that next step. You know, we talked about the difference between like, you know, um, audience and community. Um, it's about having that stake. And so like, for example, we're actually rolling out, we're sort of like we're building out what, what, what the now network, um, the now pass, which is the NFT that we uh, that that actually just launched, uh, you know, on um, you know this past week, uh, is the is the access pass set. So that's like the key to the ecosystem, and so now pass holders can then access the now network, and it's essentially like the foundation for everything we're doing around initiatives to build this future of, of tokenized media. And so like all of a sudden it's about, all right, we have a lot of relationships in the space. How can we leverage those to help people succeed? And success in Web3 can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Um, if you're a creator, that could look like getting uh, an opportunity with a major auction house, getting uh, connected with collectors, getting, uh, you know, a brand par a partnership, uh, leveraging the entire network that we have, have at, at play. When I say that we believe that we should be serving you up in oppor opportunities instead of advertisements, like we really mean that. And that's all, those are all areas that we want to leverage our relationships to actually create value uh, for our community. Um, I think also, you know, exclusive content and actually tokenizing content. And, and using and, and basically understanding that for all the stories we're telling and all the artists and projects and creators we're working with, there's a lot of value there and that value can be shared. So like, for example, let's say we put an artist on the quote unquote digital cover of NFT now that, you know, that cover can A, be like a one of one artwork that we do a revenue share with the artist on. We tokenize that. But also mm -hmm. we can then also take a look behind the the scenes and maybe some of the blueprints for making that or some of like the things around the process, we can have the artist tokenize those and then airdrop those to the now pass holders, to the members of the now network. And now all of a sudden they, they are getting tokenized media, tokenized content um, that, that also is part of, they're, they're sharing in the value that our storytelling is creating. And, um, and it, I think that could be a really, really powerful concept. Um, and so like in the now network, you're actually going to be able to earn 
XP points. We have these like these concepts like uh, uh, publish to earn, consume to earn, share to earn, like ways that like if you integrate, if you actually like engage with the NFT Now ecosystem, you actually have an incentive to to mm -hmm. to like you know you could exchange those XP points for different rewards. You think about it almost like like the Amex or like like Delta like like loyalty programs, right? Because as we talked about, you know, people in Web two media, there's no loyalty to media companies. Create that, create that for them and leverage all the amazing relationships that we have. And the other thing that I think is really exciting, uh, Marissa, is we are going to be decentralizing a number of our, of our content series, um, like mm -hmm. employing decentral uh, progressive decentralization, because we actually want our community to be able to become co-creators in like the stories that we're telling. So like, for example, um, you know, we did something that a lot of Web2 media companies don't do, which is we asked our community what we could be doing better at the end of like 2021. <laughs> and, uh, and they were like, Yo, you guys are like really great in terms of supporting as like established artists, but um, rising artists need more love. And we were like, okay, right. we hear you. We hear you loud and clear. So we launched a, a franchise called Next Up, which is um, like really close to my heart because it's like a, it's like a, it's like a real labor of love. Like I've always loved like supporting rising artists, um, even dating back to the music industry. And so with Next Up, um, it's it's really cool and exciting because like we get to um, we get to uh, you know create a platform to uplift artistry and like so many amazing artists have uh have kind of like like been through that but ultimately it's a pretty centralized process like mm -hmm. i consult with our editorial team we put we do our research we put together candidates and then we select five artists each month and like you know what appeals to to me about web3 is the opportunity to move beyond like gatekeeping and like the hierarchies and and democratizing access and democratizing that like say and so to me like i never wanted to be like the new gatekeeper in web3 and so like what we're excited to do is we're going to open up series like next up uh to our community and so we're actually going to be transitioning it to like a community curated token curated registry a tcr model where you're going to actually be able to vote with on-chain voting and empowering our community members to like have a say and be able to put forth nominations and the like. I mean, just just today, actually, we uh, we announced the NFT 100, which is our um, our our kind of like flagship editorial franchise, recognizing and celebrating 100 of the most influential creators and community leaders in the space. We did it last year with an amazing gala um, at the Rainbow Room. It was one of the, like it was really really special. People called it the Oscars of NFTs, and so like it was just <laughs> like it was a really really special room. It was really really amazing bringing all these incredible creators and and talents together. Um, but, and so like this year we were like, you know what, when we do, when we think about doing this, um, this, uh, nomination process, we, we opened up nominations, uh, to our now pass holders. We're like, you know, obviously it's still an editorial franchise where like the editorial department's going to have the final say, but we were, we empowered the now pass holders to be able to have a say in like putting forward nominations and getting candidates directly to us. And so for consideration, and so I'm really excited to continue on that journey. Um, as we, so when I think about tokenized media, there's, there's like two elements to it. There's the actual tokenization of content and mm -hmm. there's also what like unlocking the power of tokenized community around, mm -hmm. around, uh, the media model and around like storytelling. So you've covered the, the now pass and basically tokenized media to granular detail. And thank you so much for that. I think the question that really arose out of what you had to say for me was sort of the relationship or the balance that you have to strike as, you know, as a media platform with a lot of journalistic integrity, which we've spoken about before and making sure that you stay the trusted authority within the space balanced against empowering your community to have a voice in what is covered so it's how do you balance this relationship between being i guess a beacon of truth for your community but also being a vehicle through which or like a a speaker phone or a megaphone through which your community can project whatever they have to say outwards to the world because that is a bi-directional relationship that i can i think if not done correctly puts you in a precarious position. So how do you anticipate what that challenge is going to look like and work your way through it? It's a really great question. And look, like that's the reason why we're doing the progressive decentralization model. Like we're not a DAO and we're not going to become one. Like, you know, that's at the end of the day, like we're not going to like 
fully decentralize the entire newsroom to the point where like only the like the community can can have a say like could say what what gets covered across the board right we're always going to need mm -hmm. to retain our own unique editorial integrity our integ our editorial vision and our editorial voice right um but I think what's really exciting is is being able to open up these different series and these different franchises that lend themselves really well to 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 participation and to rewarding participation and to making sure that like these ones and that we're very like transparent about methodologies and and like you know if this is a community curated series we make that really clear you know this is a community curated series now pass holders were empowered to do this to do that and so like to me I think it's like it's striking that right balance and I think also um, you know. Part of it is ensuring we have a great community. And like if you, you know, it's really, really exciting to me because um, so many amazing artists and so many amazing builders and community leaders have, uh, you know, have minted or have picked up now passes and are now like a part of that. And so we're building a really special community of people that I think um, are in it for the right reasons, you know, and like that was one of the reasons, too, why we wanted to why we launched in the middle of a bear market. Like I always say bear markets are for builders. Like it's the real ones who are showing up these days, right? Like it's the people who are true believers in the space. You know, the bear markets shake out the scammers. They shake out the speculators. They And so like um, I always say it's like if we're going to be super serving a community, I want to do it with the real ones. And so like I've been really it's been really, really special to see like, you know, the, the community come together and um, and like the community even like self polices to a degree. Like, you know, if someone's in there being toxic or if someone's in there, like doing something that like in a discord is that's not in line with our values, like, you know, it's not it, like we have a great community team who will swoop in. But sometimes like our community members even swoop in sooner and are like, yo, like, that's not that's mm -hmm. not what this is about. That's not here. And so I think it's like part of it is like, you know, understanding that, um, you know, there will be limits to to where we decentralize, you know, the the content mm -hmm. creation and, and curation process um, and that, you uh, that to me, what I really see it as is like this additive force, like to me. And that's another thing I think that's really important is like we're thinking about building out this whole like creator and contributor network where people are incentivized to create a contribute where they can actually earn these XP points, you know, and, and the like within our ecosystem and these different rewards. Um, and like it, it, it augments all of the like original, you know, like editorial journalistic coverage that we're already doing and will continue to do, um, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not like, it's not an, or it's an, and if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. It's about like creating, like continuing to grow and build out this entire network while still always, while still showing up in the ways that we are. And in fact, doubling down on some of this really critical cover, like part of the act, part of like the value proposition of being a part of the now network is like these exclusive, exclusive content, these like deep dive reports, this, uh, you know, these kind of like tools that are amazing. By the way, our, 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 I just got to shout out Aaron Baker, our, our CTO and creative director. Just like he's absolutely brilliant. He's also the artist behind the Now Pass. He did all of the generative art himself. Um, he co he did all of the smart contract he coded. Um, we do have uh, with, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our awesome director of blockchain technology, Brett. And like, you know, he's like, he's he's cra like he's just like this he's like a unicorn you know and so like he's actually building out from a tech perspective the now network and all these different tools and like data like uh data tools and like uh, kind of like this this membership portal that will that will launch um that will be able to like essentially just like help help you succeed in web3 you know whether you're a creator a collector like a brand a builder like we know that like you know, success means different, uh, different things, to different people. And we know that like through our amazing relationships and our network and our community relations, mm -hmm. like we can really help. And um, that was also, um, Marissa, why we decided to launch the now pass with a pretty like a relatively limited supply. Like it's only a 2750 total supply. Um, you know, we didn't want to go 10 K. We didn't want to go like some big number because we also <laughs> recognize that like that's dilutive in terms of being able to really super serve. And, um, mm -hmm. and this is, this is a journey we're all taking together. Like, you know, the now network will be built over time, not overnight. Like, you know, and if I told you that we have every single thing figured out for the next five years, like that would be disingenuous because anyone who thinks they have the next five years figured out when this space moves so quickly and new technologies can pop up anytime. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, that you have to be nimble. You have to be flexible. That said, we have a very clear vision for what the now mm -hmm. network will become. And um, and I and I'm really excited to to start to like roll out these different uh, these different tools, these different features, these different partnerships, these different initiatives, um, where we can just continue to like really reward and super serve our community while redefining 
what the role of a media publication is uh, in the space. Right. And I think, I think what it all boils down to, which is something that applies to not just media, but the creator economy and just, I think, blockchain at large, is that while blockchain technology serves as a fundamentally important bedrock for all of this new technology to arise, decentralization as a principle isn't a panacea for everything. So understanding where it applies and where it doesn't is going to be of critical importance as we set out this infrastructure. And I mean, like Matt, we've covered a lot of ground today. So we've covered your backstory. We've covered the origins of NFT now. We've covered tokenized media. We've covered protecting your mental health in the Web3 space, collecting on Tezos and why Tezos is a bit of a safe haven against a lot of the noise. So I just really want to take the opportunity to thank you for everything that you shared today. I think it's really, really valuable perspective. And I think it's going to not only offer a lot of questions to our audience, but also a a lot, sorry, a lot of answers, but it's going to enable our audience to start asking a few more critical questions about how we actually take this space forward and the conversations we really need to start having amongst ourselves about what the future is that we're actually trying to create rather than necessarily being passive recipients of how this is all building around us. So, you know, thank you so much. And if there's any other, you know, last minute plugs you want to share before you go, please go for it. Well, first off, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, much love to Tez Talks and to the the Tezos community. Um, As I said, like, you know, I, I always like I, I sometimes say that like I don't know that if I would have stayed sane like over if it if it weren't for collecting on Tezos and like I really mean it. <laughs> um, it's been like really therapeutic for me, and so um, and and shout out to all the amazing artists and uh, and uh, and just like builders and collectors on, on the ecosystem um, who, who who show up every day. But um, yeah, look, I mean, I think like we're like I'm really passionate about what we're building. Uh, with with the with, uh, the now network and, and NFT now, I would encourage anyone who's who's interested to head over to nowpass.xyz. You can learn more about the now pass there, and also um, you can pick one up on OpenSea um, if you're if you're interested in joining the community. Um, also, would encourage everyone to follow along at NFT now. Uh, it's at NFT now across uh, across the board with uh, you know Twitter, Instagram, etc. And then um, yeah, I'm at at Matt Medved, and um, you know I think that. Uh, there, there's a lot of really exciting developments in the works. Like we're really just getting started. Um, and, uh, I always say that, that, uh, an NFT drop or an NFT release is a beginning. It's not an end. And so every day is day one for us. And so, uh, we're really excited to, uh, to be taking this journey, uh, with our community and, uh, and welcome, uh, and welcome anyone who's interested to get involved and, and be a part of it. Thank you so much again, Matt. And hopefully I will see you next week at, uh, NFT NYC. That's right. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'll see you there. Thanks, Matt. Thanks again. Thank you.